Greetings comrades and welcome to the Eastern Border. Today we're back with more news and uh, well at the beginning I would like to give some updates about how uh, my trip planning of the United States is going. For starters we're gonna enter at JFK Airport at 2.40 or 2.50 p.m. and then we're gonna go to the West End Avenue at about 800 numbers. I really don't want to give out my public address and my friend's public address here in the show but you know if any one of you wants to pick us up with a car, that'd be nice. And after that, we are in our plans, there is like visiting Maine, Portland, Maine, and the 9th. And then we're going to stay overnight at some place, which is apparently a Civil War museum on a lake, like floating and everything. It's going to be crazy, but uh, we're going to be in Maine from 9th to 10th. And I don't know if we're going to leave from 10th to 11th, but sometime at that point, we're going to go down to D.C., and then we're going to be in D.C. from 10th to about 6th or so. And then we're going to go back to New York City and, you know, fly back home on the 19th. It's going to be a whole pack two weeks. It's going to be great. But uh, today I'm going to tell you about the situation on the front lines. I'm going to use Igor Zdanov, so, uh, sorry, Oleg Zdanov, because, well, Girkin's been kind of quiet because he hasn't have any personal information happening on there and talk about some political events happening out there. And answer some listener questions, because, well, as this episode turned out to be quite short, then we decided to just, you know, do something about, about the questions. Also, again, thanks to all the Patreons. Everyone who wants to support the show, please go to patreon.com slash Eastern Border, or remember that these are important, or just go to our Twitter page, at Eastern underscore Border, and click the little money button there. You know, the thing that looks like a cash thing. It's weird. But about the front line. Zdanov reports, he's a Ukrainian person, but I'll be in intermingling what comments I have from Igor Girkin as well uh, there, because, well, he's he's getting more doomy and gloomy, really, which is good for us, I suppose, as we want Ukraine to win this war, but that also kind of makes my job a bit, a bit harder, you know. Because I can't use his sources as much, which is why I'm using, which is why I'm using Oleg Zdanov, and I'm gonna intercept with Girkin when I can. So Zdanov states that no major chances and changes have occurred in the past day. The front line is stable, with areas of increasing and decreasing activity of the hostilities. Battlefield overview: Volyn Polesny direction, which is from Belarus to the northern parts. Deployment observed of additional electronic warfare devices by, Be by the Belarusian armed forces. No other major changes. Belarusian forces continue rapid response exercises. El electronic warfare equipment is more defensive rather than offensive, but we are yet to see what they are preparing for. Here, by the way, is the first spot where Girkin intercedes and says that Lukashenko is going to have to go to war if he wants to keep power, which I sort of agree with, but going to war also will mean him losing power. It's not as simple as it seems. Northern direction. No changes, intensive shelling continues. Sunny Oblast suffered the most. Slavyansk direction. More shelling by the Russian forces using all available artillery means. Sabotage groups attempted reconnaissance toward Mo Mozovka without success. Kramatorsk direction. No changes. Artillery and airstrikes continue with positional fights. Bakhmut direction. Artillery and airstrikes at different sections. Russian forces attempted reconnaissance towards Yakolevka. Russian sabotage group was discovered and destroyed. Russian forces attempted assault at Vernishka and Solidar without success. Refused to initial positions with losses. As of now, assault operations continue towards Bakhmut. This, by the way, is also agreed with by Igor Girkin, who stated that, uh, you know, the Russian struggle is is kind of experiencing difficulties in this direction. And by the way, talking about artillery shelling, this is uh, some piece of news that I want to talk about because, you know, uh, there was this uh, news about this fake flag attack by the Russian authorities. And, uh, well, they publicly stated there was HIMARS who struck these Russian, uh, who struck these Ukrainian prisoners who were previously defenders of Azovstal. And turns out that not only did they prove false evidence about the situation, because it's obviously not high Mars, they also publicly invited everyone else from international organizations to come and inspect the positions. 
And uh, turns out Red Cross did take them up on this. But um, apparently, well, they also just denied Red Cross any access to these positions. I mean, if you invite 49 experts to make an independent analysis on the, on the supposed war crime that you claim the other side has committed, then actually after that, not letting them go and inspect anything, yeah, that's not, not, that's not a good look. Now, there's been many theories about this already, and one of them is that Russians locked up all the prisoners inside and then used grenades to basically kill them all. But there's also a theory that this actually might have been some airstrikes. There's a lot of theories about everything going around. I'm not sure which is which, but I'm pretty sure, almost certain, that it wasn't an accidental strike because it was the only thing that was struck nearby and that Russians really just decided to get rid of their prisoners of war this way, since, you know, trading them would look bad. You can't really trade Azov soldiers if you're Russia, right? And um, blaming Ukraine for them, also a nice little trick, which is just amazing. But um, carrying, carrying on with the news from the front. Novopavlovska is a Porozhye direction. Artillery and airstrikes, positional fights, reconnaissance by fire towards Marinka without success. Enemy has retreated. That is, Russians have retreated. Regrouping of the Rap Russian forces towards the Zap Zaporozhye direction. Yuzhny Bug. Artillery and airstrikes, active air reconnaissance of the Ukrainian positions. Increased activity of the Russian forces towards the Krivyerich direction. The Black Sea. Notable is increase in activity in the Black Sea, especially Russian aviation in the northwest section. Most likely related to the grain deal that is currently going on, which is, by the way, working, which is why some sanctions are being, for some reason, kind of made easier, which I don't agree with, because I believe sanctions need to be as harsh as humanly possible. Also, now there are six caliber missile carriers in the Black Sea capable of firing up to 44 missiles. However, these are located between, between Crimea and Novorossiysk, not close to Ukraine. And in the Black Sea thing, a lot of interesting things happened because two days ago it was the, um, the national day of the Navy, Russian Navy, and apparently a suicider drone, you know, a kamikaze drone, struck some... Um, struck some officer building uh, during the middle of the day, and neither side has taken responsibility yet, but in either case, this looks like a terrible, terrible incompetence on the Russian side. Ukraine city shelling. Mikolaev and Nikopol were attacked. Likewise, Sumy was shelled seven times. Kharkiv was also shelled. Ukrainian strikes. Strikes at Skadovsk, Energodar, railway station at Bilovka in Kherson Oblast, where a train with personnel weapons and vehicles was destroyed. This appears to have resulted in significant casualties. Jankovi and Simferopol hospitals are full. Wounded are being taken much further to Sevastopol. Sevastopol, by the way, was uh, where this whole event, a massive parade in the honor of in the honor of uh, the Russian Navy was supposed to be held. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of a bit ill today. <laughs> I need to get back better on because you know, trips on the fifth, so not that easy. Change of tactics. If previously reconnaissance by fire and assault operations were conducted by more or less numerous forces, at least a BDG up to 200, 300 people for assault and company size for reconnaissance, 100 and 150 people, now the Russians are utilizing sabotage groups of 50 to 20 people. These small groups attract Ukrainian fire on their position to understand where the Ukrainian positions are, including artillery. Ukraine now counteracts this impact by using artillery adjusted uh, by using artillery adjusted by anti-sabotage groups. The tendency is towards using fewer people due to a lack of personnel in the Russian forces, forcing them to preserve people. At Krivirich direction, Russians are attempting to move towards over Dnieper in the right bank. Apparently, this is according to Ukraine's plans to let in as many Russian forces as possible. The direction is being reinforced by the Russians who may renew the assault at Voronezhsk, which, however, is very far, about 100-150 kilometers from the front line. That's about 100 miles, 120 miles. These are mostly VDV units, uh, airborne assault units, with BMD vehicles. No roads there. As of now, the strengthening of the Russian group must be looked at on a larger scale. 
Certainly, the number of troops is increasing, but it's important to remember that every day, in large numbers, the Russian supplies are being destroyed. The 800 vehicles that crossed Khachovka Dam, each vehicle on average needs one ton of diesel fuel per two, three days. This is hundreds of tons of fuel that need to be transported in smaller batches over the river, which is complicated further by the destruction of the bridges. Railway bridges are not in use. The only available roads are Kakhovka HBP and the pontoon crossing at Kherson. Russian forces are unlikely to be able to start an offensive on 5th to 6th of August. The troops are still being transferred to Melitopol, Kherson and the Red Bank of Dnieper. The railway line from Crimea to Kherson was cut off, preventing the beginning of an offensive. Part troops were thrown from Mariupol to Donetsk to reinforce LDPR army corps. There is also some movement in Kharkiv Oblast, where likely the secondary strike will be done to prevent Ukrainians to transfer away forces. Generally, the situation is escalating. Russians are likely preparing an offensive, but at the moment this is likely well known by the Ukrainian command, with several options available to them. So, we have a bit weird situation on the front, and a bit, um, bit different analysis that has happened since... Well, currently, as we can see, Russia is preparing their operations, but, you know, not very successfully and a bit slowly. Meanwhile, events are happening around, uh, happening around the world. For example, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, which is apparently, well... China is not happy about this, and I'll try to look into this in a future episode, but it's not going to be easy. Meanwhile, in Kosovo, well, which is, to a lot of people, southern part of Serbia, but to a lot of other people, independent state, an independent state to most of EU and other, well, normal countries. Basically, what happened was that they wanted to adopt symmetrical mirror image kind of uh, terms to counteract Serbian influence there in the area by forcing the Serbian population who visit from Serbia to Kosovo to get special documentation about their visit. This caused a mass amount of protests in the Kosovo capital. However, well, the United States government managed to dissuade Kosovo from acting in such pattern, at least for a month, just delay this whole situation, because, well, it seems quite obvious that Russian troops and Russian special forces have been into all this situation. Which, by the way, also answers one of my questions, because one of the questions given out to us on Twitter was by Secret, Secret Police podcast. Great show, by the way, you should go check him out. And he asked me what the role of the FSB is in this war. And their role is, as usual, just, you know, sabotage and secret operations. And I have no doubt that they've been involved in the Kosovo incident which is, in a way, tied to the Taiwan incident, because Russia is now poking everyone who is at least somewhat friendly to them to do something that just shows in how bad of a position they are. I mean, they have a lot of equipment, a lot of things, but they're not working very well because of all the corruption. So now they're just trying out other options. The FSB is there to do that. Quite obvious, really. But, um, in a way... <sighs> In a way, all the situation kind of reminds me that recently in Montenegro and Chernogore, the Black Mountain, by the way, in their original, in their original language, uh, this kind of, you know, made me compare, compare all these situations because over there, uh, when, I was, when I was in the Balkans, in Serbia and Bosnia in about 2020, uh, there was like a lot of issue about their elections and all this stuff going on there. And what turned out is that recently 15 people have been accused of and, you know, after a year and a half of trials, finally, you know, a verdict was given and now they've, they've, they're they going to go for treason into prison and apparently two Russian citizens are involved as well because it has been proven in court that the Russian citizens tried to incite revolts, incite a change of government, kind of a coup, which, is, which was supposed to happen there, but that was unsuccessful. So right now, Russia is super active about this whole situation. We have another question from uh, someone called Nincompoop. I, yeah, weird Twitter profile names. Uh, profile names, they, they posted two, two questions. Number one, why is Russia agreeing to the grain deal? What is, in, what is in it for them? And two, why do they keep bombing a desk despite the grain deal? Well... <laughs> And the grain deal, I think, only thing in them for uh, in only thing in them is kind of lowering of some sanctions, 
and some prestige, really. There's nothing else in it for them, because they still claim in their propaganda channels to be using this whole Ukraine situation as a kind of a kind of a huge victory for for themselves. So you know, it's a more of a political gain, I think. Uh, it's more about you know showing the world that Russia is not as bad, and maybe some sanctions getting lifted. Why do they keep being bombing a desk despite the grain deal? Well, because some people who are colonels or something are really dumb. And although they want to conquer this, uh, they still keep bombing it because, well, something needs to be bombed. Very same reason. And another question, which is, well, I'm sorry for not getting into more of these, but, um, yeah. F from other questions, which I probably can't, I can't answer, is uh, my friend from Nebraska, Ganglo Saxon, on, on Twitter, he asked me, have I seen that new Chinese rifle to choose the bullet sideways? The answer is no, no, I haven't, and uh, I'm not a rifle expert, but it looks weird. It looks really weird, and uh, not much to comment on that one. But Bohemian Peasant, as he posts on Twitter, asked me, what's the mood in Belarus? Well, depends on whom you ask. If you ask the common people, they want to get rid of Lukashenko since 2020. Belarus is not a simple place, after all, it has about 10 million people living in it. And although Lukashenko might want to prove as this benevolent dictator and do everything on his own and do all these things that are, you know, on Putin's side and all that stuff, he just might not be able to. On average, the average Belarusian is not happy about this war because Belarusians are very decent people, really good folks. So, um, you know, they're not that interested in the continuing of all this mess. We were also asked some questions which answered directly on Twitter. One of them was about an update on the situation on the Georgia regarding Ukraine. But uh, we decided to make a separate episode on this whole subject, inviting History of Georgia as our guests. So that is going to be there in the future. But um, yeah, that's about it for this episode. Sorry if I didn't answer all of the Twitter questions and everything, but uh, I have a limited time and the audio quality on this episode is not of the best because I'm not in my usual recording space. Now, where I am and why I sound like I'm sitting in a whole bucket or something... Uh, you're going to find out about that soon enough. It's a longer episode coming in. Um, but so far, thank you for listening. Happiness is mandatory. And please, consider supporting us on Patreon. And thank you to all the Patreons supporting us.